Good morning and welcome to COVID-19 Talk with local health authorities. With me is Dr. David Purse, representing the city of Houston. Dr. Umer Shaw, representing Harris County. This is sponsored by the Rotary Club of Houston and thank you to past president Kathy Finnerger for providing our questions. I am Stephen Williams, the director of the Houston Health Department. Okay, y'all, you, you had to know that this was going to be the first question to come up <laughs> or comment. Pfizer's announcement of their vaccine being 90% effective appears exciting. Mm -hmm. It is exciting. We agree. It's very exciting. <laughs> it's yeah, exciting. Yeah. We still need more information. Yeah, yeah. We're waiting for additional details and certainly safety and effectiveness yeah. uh, details will help us then decide what that's going to look like. And then they're looking at uh, end of this year, right, by December to start getting it out and, and obviously into the beginning of next year. But again, more yeah. details. So you know, two quick comments on that. Okay. One is that the study is not done. This yeah. was a first interim analysis. It's very good news. Right. But the study really needs to go to completion, which they're predicting is going to occur by almost by the end of this month, perhaps, which yeah. is really surprising to hear. That's right. And then if the vaccine even is available in uh, December, it's going to be small amounts. So for most of the viewers need to recognize it's going to be some months before it's available to the average uh, Houstonian. So. so you should relate to this. Dr. Host has says the news is based on a press release written for Pfizer shareholders, not scientists. And the company still has a ways to go on this. How happy should we be? And you just said it's, it's promising, it, it, yeah. it's exciting. And the next question is also related to this. Uh, the FDA still must grant emergency approval. Slam dunk, that's a question mark. Again, it's based yeah. on safety and effectiveness. Yeah. So, and, and I think that, that drives the, when, whether it's emergency use, EUA is emergency use authorization. Uh -huh. FDA giving an authorization for emergency use. But that really is driven by that information. The short answer to slam dunk is no. Yeah. That's well, they, they, got, they, got work to do. Yeah. they got work to do. Okay. Related, everybody's excited about this because it's been all over the news. Pfizer said that there, there would be doses available for 25 million at two doses each. And it is one of the vaccines that must be transmitted at super cold degrees. What difficulty would this cause in equitable distribution? Well, I think one thing is that, yes, it does need to be kept, uh, you know, at, at, a, at a super cold uh, temperatures, like minus 90. Minus 80, uh, minus 90. Uh, yeah, degrees, like yeah. And, and that requires certain kinds of uh, freezer uh, specifications. And so that absolutely is going to be a problem. But I think that's the behind the scenes aspect of what would be happening. And very important, because that is obviously mm -hmm. how we want to make sure that it's safe and, and there's no issues with it. But I think it's that kind of um, storage that then also makes it a little bit more challenging to get it out and administered because you gotta make sure you have all the storage capacity and capabilities ready. Most health departments do, but not all do, and so this is something that's yeah. also being worked on yeah, behind the scenes. The, the question really kind of goes to equity, equity I think was yes. the question, right? So I don't see there being much of a problem in major urban centers and even suburban areas because mm -hmm. uh, there are freezers that get that cold that are used for all different sorts of things. So that infrastructure exists. We just need to get some space in them. The challenge, I think, is going to be in you know rural and frontier Texas where they yeah. may not have that infrastructure. So I do see where there may be a problem in getting it you know into, into those communities. So work has got to be done to make those uh, storage capacity, storage capabilities available in all communities. But what I have seen in, in emails between local health authorities in Texas is that there are several departments that are actually ordering uh, freezers that have, have this capacity. And That's some right. of them are in, in rural areas. And as, as for here, we know that uh, there are a number of institutions that already have that capacity. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right. That's right. And, and unfortunately, due to the economic slowdown, they, they have the capacity right now, too. That's right. So a little and, serendipity there. And let's just make sure that we're clear that that's for this one type of vaccine. There right. are other vaccines that will be coming mm -hmm. soon enough, and they will not require that kind of. So it's just this particular vaccine that requires that kind of freezer storage. But the other ones that are coming down the pipe do not require it. So, so again, true. there are some things that yeah. need yeah. to be thought and about. I think the other vaccine that's even on the same platform does not require that. That's right. That. That's, that's the Moderna, Moderna one. That's right. Yeah. yeah. They were not part of warp speed. Won't that delay manufacturing of these double doses? So, uh, apparently not. Mm -hmm. According to Pfizer, it's not going to slow them down at all. Yeah, they're they, saying they, they've they're invested. already making millions. In yep. the, well, that's right. Like you said, they're, they got 25 million people means 50 million doses. Uh -huh. So, so yep. it shouldn't be a problem. Actually, I think they were talking about using FedEx uh, as a mm -hmm. part of their distribution. Private sector, yeah. But we'll see how that pans out, though. Yeah. But 
I guess the point really is is that they still have a ways to go before that. that vaccine. It's all good news, but there's still work to be done. Yeah. yeah. Right. Okay. To create immunity, our bodies must make proteins. Is that 20 days after the second shot when it is mo most effective? So, yeah, so, you know, most of these uh, vaccine regimens are coming up. Most of them are, are two-dose regimens. There's at least one that's only it's a single-dose regimen. Right. And, and, of course, we don't know the efficacy of those, but most of them are two-dose. And so they're going to stimulate the mRNA ones. They're going to stimulate your, your own cells to create the protein that your immune system will react to. Uh -huh. And so it takes a while for that all to occur. And so they're looking about 20 days. Now, after your first shot, you'll get, you know, some degree of immune response, but it won't be terribly robust. After the second one, and, and think of it this way, you get that first shot, your, uh, the mRNA is going to go into the cells, it's going to start making the protein, it's going to be in your system, your body, your immune system is going to say, what is this? This isn't supposed to be here. It then starts building its infrastructure uh -huh. to ramp up. Then when you get the second shot, it's like, oh my gosh, it's here again, and you really get the robust mm -hmm. response. So you get some immunity with the first one, you don't get the robust immunity until the second one. That's right. Okay. Since many people act like they are too busy to get the flu shot, what would you say to encourage people to take COVID vaccine as soon as they are available? Well, I would say one is that once uh, it, it, it predicates one comment, which is when it's available, it's because it's safe and effective. So when it's safe and effective, then we will say, get this shot. And we know that people don't get flu shots and other kinds of vaccinations like they should. This is a reason that all of us want to get past this pandemic. So there is an interest for all of us as community members to get a vaccine when it's safe and effective. That's what we're waiting for. That's the encouragement. It's our own self-interest so we can get past this pandemic as quickly as we can. I think everybody's ready for that. Yeah. <laughs> this is not a live virus, correct? This one is not a live virus. That is correct. And, and, and the vaccines that are live virus, those are ones that have been disabled, so they don't make you sick. Right. Okay. Uh, thank you for joining us for, for COVID-19 Talk with local health authorities. We'll be right back. The fight goes on. The battle is not yet won. By now, we're tired, asking for a tag in. But now is not the time to let down our guard. Because just when you think this opponent seems to be pinned down, it comes back to life and when you least expect it. So keep your guard up. Because if your mask comes off, the fight is lost for all. If you love me enough to tolerate my perfect little pets <coughs> and all their glorious dander, then of course you'll visit nhtsa.gov slash the right seat to make sure I'm in the right car seat. Do you remember our first group photo? This is it. Smiles all around even though we were all nervous. Who could have imagined that our first weekend together would soon turn into a lifetime of memories. You're an amazing young man. Your brothers and sisters really look up to you. They're a big brother. It's so cool to watch the adult that you've become, and you really have done as much for us as you think we've done for you. You know, it took 20 years, and I got my third child, who was 17 at the time. There are so many rewards in life. You coming into our home was one of the greatest rewards we could have ever had. I just, I ain't never felt so much love before in my life. Welcome back to COVID-19 Talk with local health authorities. Man, vaccines is really hot. Mm -hmm. Yeah. This and other vaccines have become very political. How can health officials assure the public. There's been a lot of conversations yeah. about that. I yeah. just talked about that, about, you know, that 
health officials are not going to get behind any vaccine un until we feel comfortable that the safety and effectiveness have been worked out. Mm -hmm. And that's where the public should wait, not for politicians, elected officials, but really for public health and health officials to say this vaccine is safe and effective, whichever one it is, or whichever ones it, it is, that these are effective, they're safe, mm -hmm. And that's where the public should be assured. That's our job. Yeah, and, yeah. you know, David, I don't know your other Yeah, no, no, about I that. completely agree with you. And I would also point out that a lot of the, this consternation comes from the conspiracy theorists, right? Yeah. Saying that things are being rushed. And I point out to them that nobody is more aware of the microscope that they're under, more so than the pharmaceutical companies. Mm -hmm. They cannot afford to make a, a mistake, especially a safety mistake. That's right. So regardless of whether you have faith in the CDC right now or the FDA, those pharmaceutical companies, they cannot afford, from a business standpoint, to have a safety problem. So they're not gonna lie about anything because that'll come back to bite them and destroy them. So um, their, their stocks will crash. Yeah. yeah, so all this extra added attention really is reinforcing the safety issues. Right. So. And it's a different kind of vaccine, different kind of virus. But let's remind ourselves in 2009 with H1N1, it was also in the spring when it was a novel virus, right, mm -hmm. H1N1 that, that was discovered and there was a lot of effort at that time to ramp up uh, manufacturing and it was in the fall that we had it. So it was also a matter of months, completely different process, completely different yeah. virus, absolutely. But I want everybody to know that, that that vaccine was safe and effective when it finally was rolled out. Similarly, this will be safe and effective when it's finally rolled out. Could you kind of elaborate on the process that the, these trials go through? I think they're in about like yeah. So, mm -hmm. so basically, with a uh, a research trial, there's you know the, the fundamentals of any research trial, human research trials, is it has to go through you know the ethics panel first to make sure it's an ethical risk to to take because whatever you're experimenting with, you know there's it's it's unknown. That's why you're experimenting with it, right? So there's all kinds of preliminary work done in animals and labs and and stuff before the first human gets it to make sure that it it appears like it's likely to be safe. And then when you have the trial, you've got the group that gets it, and then you've got another group that gets, uh, is the control group that doesn't get it. Now, they may get a needle in the arm, but they just, nobody, the people of Michigan don't know. There is, apart from that, a data safety monitoring committee or a data safety committee. They go by a couple of different names. And these are people who are experts in that field, who have no um, interest in the, in the medication or the vaccine, and they also have no conflict of interest mm -hmm. in it. And they are very carefully selected. The people who are the primary researchers, they don't even know who's on the safety committee. Uh -huh. All right, so it's complete anonymity. Now they are the only ones who can look at the data, data being, you know, who got it, who didn't, and what are the outcomes. They're the only ones who are able to look at the outcomes. And there are scheduled, in the, in the initial program, there are scheduled times when they're gonna look at the data. And uh, depending on how many people, there's, there's two, sometimes three of these opportunities where the data committee comes and looks at it. And they will generally come up with one of three answers. One is, oh my God, there's a terrible problem which nobody anticipated you have to stop. Mm -hmm. That's not common. Mm -hmm. The other one is, oh my God, this is so effective and so good, we cannot ethically continue on with this thing because the people in the control arm need to get this medication. And then you see that like with cancer therapy drugs mm -hmm. sometimes. Mm -hmm. And the third most common one is, there's no problems, it's progressing safely, you need to continue on to the next step. That's the most common answer. That's right. And then there's the last sta stage of this, which is once you've gotten all that worked out, is to ramp up production to an amount mm -hmm. that allows you to get it out to the public. And so that's yeah. the last stage uh, yeah. after all the trials. Yeah. Thanks for clarifying that. It's 2020 and anything is possible. If you were president or like, what would you promise to do first to help in the pandemic? Well, I think the first promise would be to make sure science and evidence are driving those decisions. And I think that's first and foremost, and to really get the, the, um, the expertise of not just the folks who are uh, academicians and who are the ones that are really uh, experts, but also the ones who are in the trenches that have been working in state and local public health and getting their perspectives. I think those that would be the, the first, is to is science evidence and then getting the expertise of those who are living the experiences for the last nine, 10 months. Yeah, I would, I would say the same thing. We gotta go to uh, science. Yeah. So a heavy emphasis on science. Yeah, well, and, and a single unified message across the nation. Yeah. 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 Pregnancy tests at 90 to 100% accurate. Why is mass rapid testing taking so long for this virus? 
Not sure. Not sure. Not sure. And yeah. pregnancy tests and the tests that we're looking at are they're completely different yeah. platforms. So. Yeah. Well, well, the second part of this question is, <clears throat> why is mass rapid testing taking so long for this virus? Actually, rapid testing is available. Yeah, yeah, and we have capacity. <coughs> you know, our, our testing numbers are up. I assume yours are too. Yeah. Our numbers are up. We still have capacity. So. Sure. And we want to con. con contradistinct that from, so that's PCR testing that we're doing at city county mm -hmm. sites, but we want to, you know, say that that's different than when you hear about antibody testing and antigen right. testing, which is a different, and you can still hear, hear a lot of people say rapid or, or quickly, and we get that, but we're talking about PCR testing, which is really, yeah. um, you know, a different yeah. uh, type could, of testing. We could probably spend 30 minutes just explaining the differences between the tests. That's right. right. But I do want you to take a couple of <coughs> minutes, as I did earlier, mm -hmm. and tell us, you know, what is the appropriate use of these rapid tests? Because I was, uh, I, I guess, talking to a friend or whatever, and they were saying, well, I'm going to go in, I'm going to get these results in five minutes. And I had to explain to them you know, what that would mean. So why don't yeah, we just take that? Well, let me start with, okay, so PCR testing is what we are doing uh, at our sites. And the PCR testing is, again, it's where you see the nasal swab that goes into your nose and, and, and it, it, the sample is then run. And it's usually the run part where it has to get to a lab and then the lab has to process and get the results back. That's why it takes a couple of days, right? So mm -hmm. those aren't, you don't get those in 15 minutes. When you hear 15 minutes, it's one of two. It's either antibody testing or antigen testing. The antibody testing is what David talked about earlier, which was the, the immune system is ramping up because it's, you know, it's, uh, it's seeing the virus. Not, in this case, a, um, a, a vaccine, but it's actually seeing a virus, uh -huh. and it ramps up. So you're testing the ramp up of that, of that immune system. That can generally miss early when you haven't ramped up, and it can also have some types of antibody that you may or may not pick up right away or in the testing modality. So there's some falsities that you can get out of that. And the third is antigen testing, which has been really a lot of the focus around schools and, and other businesses. And antigen testing is where you do get some of the virus, but it's actually not amplified like the PCR testing. And so if it's positive, excellent, great. Mm -hmm. But if it's negative, you still don't know and you may need to repeat the test or do the PCR test. So PCR test is the gold standard. Antibody and antigen testing can come back quickly, but it's got to be used carefully in how you interpret the results. That's what's missing in the context for what people are doing out in the community. Yeah, yeah, that's exactly right. It, the rapid tests are, are useful if the test is positive. You can trust that. Uh, unfortunately, if it's negative, you, you know, you got to put it in the, in the whole context of whether you got symptoms or not. You know, why did you get tested? There's a lot more to it than that. That's right. Thank you for joining us for COVID-19 Talk with Local Health Authorities. We'll be right back.
hear someone go, didn't it come from you guys? Strangers cough at me. Move away from me. Someone spit towards my direction. All the stereotypes that we've worked so hard to break are just gonna be reversed. And I won't let that happen. We all have to play our part. I donate my plasma. I've been making masks. We deserve respect as much as everybody else. I'm a firefighter, not a virus. I'm a mask maker, not a virus. I'm a nurse. I'm a delivery woman. A chef. A neighbor. Artist. Bus driver. I'm a doctor. Fight the virus. Fight the virus. Welcome back to COVID-19 Talk with Local Health Authorities, sponsored by the Rotary Club of Houston. Should I get a COVID test before giving blood? You don't, you don't need to. Uh, um, when they take your blood, when you give blood, they test it. Uh, actually, they, they test it for antibodies, see if you've had it. But you don't need to worry. You don't have to take a test before you give blood. I give blood all the time. The Danish government is getting rid of their minks because the virus between them and humans and back again. So far, it seems we can transmit to animals, but cats can transmit to each other. If a person in the house is positive, should we get someone to take our pets? I don't think so. There's been no recommendations along those lines. So yeah, we can spread the virus to cats and dogs. Mm -hmm. It does not seem to be common. It has happened. But when you consider all the you know tens of thousands of families <coughs> that have had somebody who's got COVID and their pets, and it's, it's not, so I, I would not, I would not do anything different. You know, and here's the other thing is that pets are important to families, uh -huh. right? And so mm -hmm. I think that the downside of getting rid of your pet, even temporarily, would be greater than the upside. So we have a puppy now, and I just, <laughs> oh, that's right. you know, that's so, right. And, and our life has been turned completely upside down by this puppy over the last uh, few weeks. And I'll tell you that the one, and I completely agree with David, you, what you just said about just being a part of the family, because I think 90% of our photos are now about the puppy. Um, <laughs> but is that if you are with symptoms, regardless of what the symptoms are, if it's a cold flu or, or COVID, is just be careful. I mean, just, just, just be cautious around your, your pet as well. You don't want to just, you know, cough, sneeze, and then go touch your, that's just not right to your, you know, to your furry animal as well, uh, your furry friend. And then the second thing that I just wanted to add is that we, while there have been cases of being able to transmit to the cat or dog, what we haven't seen is reverse that the cat or dog is transmitting to others. Mm -hmm. And so I think that's also important to, to remember. So if somebody comes to your house yeah. and you've got it, um, your dog or cat has it, they shouldn't be in your house, first of all, but if they come to your house, they're not going to get it from the cat or dog. They're going to get it from you. So, right. yeah. Texas cases are continuing to rise. Yeah. Houston and Harris County still seem to be better than most. I keep thinking the positivity rate is a weak indicator. And you have previously said not to look at only one indicator. What is your current stat opinion? So, yeah, I've been the one who's been saying that. And, and our positive rates between the city and the county do remain comparatively low to where they have been in the past, mm -hmm. but they're creeping up. That's that's the concern. Um, and that's the other thing that says you don't look at the number, you look at the trend. So our, mm -hmm. our trend, unfortunately, is going the wrong direction, but it's going so slowly. So that's a good news, bad news. Same thing in the hospitals, and that's another even later indicator, is the hospitalizations are, again, creeping up, but slowly. So what I take from that is that in the wastewater is showing the exact same thing. So we now we got three indicators all showing the same thing. So that's probably the virus is creeping up. And we've got holidays coming, we've got cold weather coming, we've got you know viral season coming. And so what that tells me is that now is the time for Houston's to double down on us as individuals being really diligent about all these, you know, the wearing the masks and okay. social distancing. But here's the other thing we need to be diligent about is quarantine. Mm -hmm. You know, we're at the point now where the public needs to understand that, you know, if you've been exposed to someone and you're feeling fine, you, you really do have to quarantine for 14 days, even though you feel totally yeah. fine. Because yeah. I'm, I'm seeing a lot of people wearing masks now. Our numbers are really creeping up. And I'm wondering how, you know, do we need to change our, our attention and focus more on making sure people understand what isolation means and what quarantine means? Is that the Achilles heel that we're facing? I, I don't know. But... But we're doing a lot of things right. Yeah, I would say good news, bad news, right? We're doing, we've got good news that we're not as bad as some of those communities outside of, of our community. And also it's, it's bad news because then there's complacency that fits in. Like we don't need to worry about it. Well, the reason we're not doing as badly is because people are wearing masks and doing things. And I want to give credit to our community. But I also want to say that it, I've been saying it's a canary in a coal mine. That if you're seeing it in other parts of Texas, especially El Paso, you're seeing in other parts of the country, 40 plus states, right? Texas has just exceeded a million cases, the first state in the country to do that. We've got to be careful in our community. So wear your mask, wash your hands, watch your distance. Yeah. Thanksgiving has become a stressful subject for our family and causing tremendous guilt. The CDC, of course, encourages us to weigh 
risk factors. One of my adult children was in close contact with someone when the person tested positive on November the 9th. What would be the earliest negative test that would factor on our November 26th plan? plans. Right. Let, me, let me take that on. So mm -hmm. this, is a, this is a very good and very loaded question. So the, uh -huh. the, if your family member is a close contact of a known case, then they need to quarantine for 14 days, mm -hmm. period. You can't test out a quarantine. That's right. Now, it's worthwhile for them to go and get tested because if they should test positive, uh -huh. then they can identify yet another ring of people who need a quarantine. Uh -huh. But you don't test out of quarantine, unfortunately. Mm -hmm. And it's a 14-day window. So you know what, what, uh, what calendar date is Thanksgiving this year? Uh, 26, I believe. 26? Yeah. All right, yeah. so 26 minus 14, there's the date that you need to start your quarantine. Yeah. Okay. There's a virus, there's a theory that some patients get rid of the virus, but their defenses went the wrong way and created cytokine storms? Cytokine storms, yeah. Cytokine storms. An immune system response that damages t tissues and organs. Will you explain, please? So a cytokine storm is when your system, your body's immune system sort of overreacts to, a, to whatever the pathogen is, whether it be a virus or a bacteria. And so we've, we've seen this before. Um, and it's more common to occur to people who have never had any exposure to a particular pathogen. So like with coronaviruses, we've all been exposed to coronaviruses mm -hmm. since kids because so many of the cold viruses uh -huh. are coronaviruses. So there's one particular one. It's less likely to set off a cytokine storm. We have heard some cases of, of where it's believed that that may be what the problem is. Um, but. Um, yeah, a truly novel pathogen is more likely to cause that problem than something like okay. SARS-CoV-2. Toxilizumab is a go-to for treatment on issues such as severe rheumatoid arthritis. It sounds like it's been used in first two days of ICU admission, but does not seem to be as effective as thought. Are there any new treatment cocktails? Well, so Ectemera is the, it's a IL-6, uh, uh, it, it, take, it takes a sort of aim on the IL-6 protein, and so it's an anti-inflammatory use for rheumatoid arthritis, and really what it's, it's designed to do is to lessen the complications from those who are intubated from COVID-19 pneumonia. And so there have been early studies in, in uh, Italy uh, for this, and it's been used, but I'll tell you that right now the therapeutics is changing quite a bit. I mean, mm -hmm. there, there are every day or every week, you're hearing of new therapeutics that are being approved. And so I think the list continues. But I think the key is, let's not get sick in the first place. Prevent right. it. Three W's. Wash your hands, <laughs> wear your mask, watch your distance, and get tested. Those are, you do those okay. things, then I, we're in a good place. I just place. heard a report that the virus can stay on the surface for three days. Recently, it's not seemed that important to clean groceries and deliveries like we had back in the spring. What is your advice? Well, I'll go back and I'll say what I've been saying all along and, and, okay, and, and, and this is that is that the, um, you can test for a virus on a surface. That doesn't mean that it's still able to be, uh, infect somebody. So when you hear about these three-day things, I kind of raise one eyebrow to it. But the bottom line is you can transmit viruses from, from surfaces. You do need to um, uh, clean them as much. But with this particular virus, it really seems that the aerosol from okay. speaking, coughing, laughing, that seems to be the number one way to spread We still do it at our house, but it's not, you yeah. know, cleaning the groceries. But, you know, it's, it's the, the usual way is by air. Yeah. An article in The Lancet suggests that we have not done enough to deal with misleading information on vaccines. Who can do that? All of us. Yeah, All every one of us. us. What is the effective reproduction rate? So this is, if one person is infected, how many more people can you expect that person to infect? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. We would like it to be less than one. Okay, thank you for joining us for COVID-19 Talk with local health authorities. Joining us was Dr. David Purse, representing the city of Houston, Dr. Umer Shaw, representing Harris County. This is sponsored by the Rotary Club of Houston. Thank you to past president, Kathy Finninger. I'm Stephen Williams, director of the Houston Health Department. See you next week. <laughs>